Hey, everybody. Um, let's talk a little bit about layout and puddles. Um, the puddle question is, actually, I'm getting more excited about the puddles right now. Let's play with puddles first, all right, and then hit some layout. Um, because I first want to show you some ways that people have handled drawing wetlands in a number of, of, of different books and resources. Um, I am going to jump over to the little document camera here and we'll take a look at some, some sketched puzzles. Puzzles? The, the puzzle of puddles. So some puddle puzzles and how to place those properly on the pages of your book. Um, so let's do some puddle puzzles. Um, before we do that, let me tell you a little bit about Tweedle Beetles because when Tweedle Beetle battle, battle and their battles in a bottle and their bottles in a puddle and uh, the puddles and a poodle and the poodles eating the noodles, they call it a peedle. Anyway, mad props to Dr. Seuss out there. Um, oh, here we go. Wait, that didn't happen the way I wanted it to. We'll try this again. Here we go. Ah, there we go. All right, this is a book by, let's back up. Oh, wrong way, by the way. There we go. This is a book by John Busby uh, called Drawing Birds. Drawing birds, drawing birds. And it's about drawing birds. And um, John Busby is, Busby is this wonderful sketcher and um, does these really loose things. And I want to, I remember, and here there were some sketches. Ah, look at this. This is cool. Let's look down at this drawing. I love, I love this drawing. Oh, isn't that awesome? All right. So um, what you're looking at here is a pen drawing with a wash of watercolor over it. And I think it's a slightly water soluble pen. And so he's, he's drawn in reflections of these birds. So what we've got is this little bird. Now, first of all, reflections are cast directly below the thing. So if you draw a line up fr from the tip of this beak down, that gets to the tip of the beak in the reflection. Shadows, that's not the case. See, the shadow is going off at a different angle out this way. It's relative to the sun. But the reflections are always straight down from whatever your point of view is. So this little bird flying over, its reflection is going to be straight down below it. Isn't that cool? Now, this little beastie, there's a little bank that is going up. And um, so if this bird, um, um, because you're, you're standing up and you're looking down on the, the bank here. And this ground is then sloping up slightly and away. If there were a bird that were sitting right here, or actually right up here, its reflection would be down here below it. It wouldn't be seen. So you could draw a little bird here and its reflection wouldn't show here. The closer you get this bird down to the water's edge, the more that you are going to be sort of, you're gonna show um, that, that full reflection. Um, actually, let me do a little diagram here just for a second. Hello, the crocodile. Um, so let's say this is your, your bird here. Um, And I want to think of the bird's weight coming down below it. It's sort of center of gravity is going to be somewhere in here. So its leg coming down is going to be somewhere uh, about like that. 
So if this bird, whoops, there we go. If this bird were standing on a mirror and your eye were as close to this plane as kind of you could get it, what you would see is this bird All right, uh, we're going to come up this way. And here's my bird's, bird's body. Um, you're actually now going to be looking at the underside of the bird. Could you uh, uh, maybe raise that up just a little? Ah. All right, you're looking at the underside of this bird. So the Mirror image is not the same image, just flipped. But here you're looking at the underside of the bird. So here's, if, if this is the area of the bird that is in shadow here. On the underside, right, you're seeing this area, the sort of larger area in shadow. Now, let's put the bank in. Um, if this is actually standing on the shore or out on the edge of a mud flat. So here's some mud flat kind of coming in like this. Then you're not seeing this part of the reflection so that the reflection would actually start like this. So if I had another bird that was further back here, it's going to be a different kind of a bird. It'll be a little straight bill bird here. Now let's kind of give it some little dowichery legs. Right, so there's another little bird back there. So it's on the ground here. All right, so what's going to be going on with its reflection? Um, it's going to be down here, right? So and I'm not drawing the neck as long because you're looking up at the underside of the neck there. So here's a little bit of this bird. So all you'd see of that bird is just its reflection right here at the edge of the water. Now, I, um, There we go. So there's going to be a relationship between these sorts of 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 shapes. Now, bearing that in mind, let's look back at this sort of wonderful John Busby diagram here. And you're seeing here, um, I, I, I love this bird back here. So here's a bird that is hidden against the rocks. See that one? Little bird hidden against the rocks. But you see its reflection really bold and clearly. Isn't that cool? I really like that. So these ones that are, here's another one that's kind of hidden up here, but there's its reflection right down there. This one, you see the reflection. This one that's back further, where is its reflection? Its reflection is just kind of coming up here. And this one's reflection is partly hidden. Think of that, that sort of that vertical relationship between things is really cool. And you kind of get the sense that this turn here is scooting right above the water surface because he's put that reflection close to it. And one last 
kind of nice John Busby little note and detail here. Here, what he's imagining is, so here is this bird. It's, if this is where the water surface is, where the X is, the bird is then the same distance below that as the real bird is above that. Isn't that neat? Imagine that being the plane of a mirror right through there. That reflection is going to be the same distance above, I mean below, as the, as the, as the bird is above. That, I think, is a, just an, an exquisite little study there. Um, now what I want to do is I'm going to jump over to just a couple of other people's um, birds in. Uh, this is a book uh, by Lars Janssen um, called Birds, and it's birds. And in here, uh, so he's this uh, very, very tall Swede. Um, and uh, he does lots of stuff in the field. And he likes shorebirds. So let's take a look at some of his watercolors of, um, of, of sort of the, what we're interested here is the kind of the edge of the edge of the wetland and marsh. So all he's doing here, isn't this neat? What, this is a great strategy. What he's doing is just got a different texture in the grass and blurring those things together in the water. That's beautifully handled. This is fun. Here is a little carefully um, sketched, probably through a telescope, a little diagram of this um, resting duck. Its reflection is directly below it. Um, he's just left out a little bit of the, the details in the reflection. But look at this. Here are just some ripples. Water, when there are little waves, the little wavelets will either be light marks in a dark surface or dark marks in a light surface. And what you've got here is that, that those, those waves are just re reflecting different parts of the sky. And so here he's put in these little dark slashes. And that's so the whole water surface is being very, very reflective. And there's a few little ripples where you are getting um, those, those darks. I think that's really nice. I want to jump over to some of these shorebirds. <clears throat> this is an oil. And notice that the water here is highly reflective. And a few little places, you've got some breaks in that, so the reflection of that coming down here, reflection of this. Think of the, this coming down. Imagine that your birds, you're starting kind of copying that reflection from here down, because this bird's legs are partly in the water right there. So what he's doing is you've got this little sketch of the turn, and then somewhere in there, you're popping that out. Um, Take a moment and say out loud what he's doing here to give you the sense of water. So he's got a position probably sitting close to the shore. You're at close to eye level. So the water here is very, very reflective. So very pale wash of yellow on that water. Gives you the sense of sort of some evening or morning light where wavelets are making are changing the angle of that reflective surface, it gets darker, and he's bringing in blue. Once you sort of see the 
you know, that like, oh, I get it. With if you're right at water level, if you so you were right down here at water level with this, you're basically seeing the same view, top and bottom. But if you're up, if you're up higher with your eye at a different um, vantage point, then you'd be seeing the back of the lap wing, but the belly in the reflection. And that's what I want to show you in there for now. The final thing here. Um, let's check out Gunnar uh, Bruzewitz. And there is one picture in here in particular that I have always loved for the puddle. And I want to show you there's, there's a puddle in a, um, in a path. Oh. The, you know, here, so here's actually, here's one. So here is, um, this is actually ice on a road. Want you to notice a couple of things about the ice on the road here. First of all, we've got contrast here, dark, wet soil and the ice edge ending there. Look at these kind of open, I shouldn't, don't wanna draw on my page. Look at these kind of open curves here, but back here, ovals side to side. As you get closer towards the towards the back, you are looking at if there are round puddles underneath you, and you look down, you're going to see a puddle like this. You're looking down into that puddle at your feet. Then you look further back, that same puzzle, that same puddle, here's your horizon, as you sort of see it retreating into the distance, um, that same puddle, you're not going to see, it's, you're not going to see this. Here's that puddle further away and then further away and then further away and then further away. No, 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 no. Because what you're going to be seeing is that this puddle that's in front of you here, as you start to look further back in space, it becomes flattened. And so when you're looking at the puddle that's back here, it's even more flattened. So as a, as you are looking further towards the distance, these, um, these ellipses are becoming increasingly flattened. Another way of visualizing this is that if you actually had a cone, so there's the bottom of the cone there, and your eye level was right here, um, your eye at this level would be seeing the cross section of this as a straight line, right? But you're looking down here and you're seeing it as an oval. So that means that one between here and there is going to be not as flat as that, not as wide as that. So you notice how this oval got flattened. So for distant if there is a little area out here where there is a puddle, I might see that as more of an open puddle. So I'm going to make it reflective. There's a little open puddle. But the one that is back here, further back here, I'm going to do this. So on your mud flats, the further you get away from where you are, the more uh, contours go from being curves like this to curves like that.
So again, if I'm drawing mud flats and there are puddles in my mud flats, the ones further away from me, those are going to be more horizontal streaks. But ones that are closer to me, I'm going to see as more open rounded shapes. To do a couple of things to this little sketch that I've got going here. Uh, one is that I want to uh, right here at the where the the ground, this mud here meets the water surface. I am going to just make that a little bit darker. Oops, wrong pen. That extra contrast will really kind of pop that out. Um, but this isn't the, the Gunnar picture that I wanted to show you. That's not the puddles one. There's this uh, where I, I don't know the page that the puddle one is on, so I'm just going to have to do a quick page flip here. Um, was that my puddles one? I thought that it was more open road. Sometimes there's a picture in your head and then you get to the picture and it's like, oh, that actually didn't show what I thought it was gonna show. Ah, oh, there it is, yay, look at this. Oh, I love this, look at these puddles here. Isn't that cool? I mean, there's so much going on in this. There is, there's a road and the road is, and so things are getting foreshortened in the distance. Then there are shadows of trees going across the road. There are then puddles in the path that are showing you the reflection of trees that are back here and the reflection of the sky that's above you. Oh man, that's, that's crazy. Um, so just on your notebook here, make a little kind of just copy sketch of the values that Gunnar is putting into this little sketch. Make a little doodle here of of, 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 of what you're sort of the, the contrast that you're seeing. Um, I'm going to now show you a, here's sort of reminds me of this little sketch by Escher. Um, that is, hold on a second. I'm getting drills. There you go. Here's a little sketch by, by Escher um, where you're, you're looking down at the reflections of those trees. So you're looking down, there's the bright sky, you've got the edges of your puddle here. And um, I, uh, this, is, this is just so much fun. I love the high contrast, super darks and super brights there in the puddle. And then I come back to here, I've got this really high contrasty puddle here, really pulls that into the foreground. Very often the darks in a reflection will be really strong. But it's also interesting that there's a little bright edge around that puddle. It makes it feel like there's some dirt there that's getting a little bit of reflection off of it. So, I, I think that that's a, a wonderful piece of wet 
land. And I'm just gonna do a quick check here, see if, All right. So that is just a, a little bit about sort of mud flats, marshes. And reflections. Now, um, if we're going to be, um, if we're going to be uh, adding vegetation into the marsh, then we've got all sorts of other things to to consider. I want to show you a couple of strategies that, again, um, Gunnar takes. Let's check this out. So here you have, um, you've got your, your marsh here. You have, um, so notice the, the high contrast in the water here, the reflections there in the water really punching in that dark. Um, those reflections are going to reflect darker than what you're seeing up here. There's, the reflections are always darker than the thing that they are reflecting. And I love how he puts you kind of you feel like you're over here on this bank because there's a little bit of you know you see these plants and then you know what's going on out there here he's doing the same thing you get a big sense of depth in this because there are these plants that are on the shore that is right next to you and then you see that that far bank there um, just going to see there's a couple other little marsh lands here. So let's draw ourselves. Let's draw ourselves a little marshland. <clears throat> And then we'll come back and we'll work with some layout. <laughs> I'm going to do a little. I'm going to do a little uh, marshland layout here. I've just got a little bit of uh, empty real estate in here. So I'm going to imagine that I have. Um, actually, I'm going to use this piece of turf out here. I'm going to have a horizon in here. Um, my marshland, um, I'm going to imagine there are going to be several sort of sets of tulies that are overlapping out here. So if I want this to have a sense of depth, I need this set of tulies here to be overlapping with this one here. And then I'm going to have another little strip of water back here. And then there's going to be some, some hills on the, 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 in the back there. So I'm going to have um, tulies coming down here. And we're going to have actually an area of exposed mud that is going to come down here. It's a little hard to see. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing lightly. Um, oh. Let me come down one level. Oh, much better, thank you. So stuff that is in the foreground, I want to do those things more sort of bold and 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 in your face. So I'm going to use this sort of Gunnar trick of I'm going to actually draw that we actually have a cattail spike here. And it's starting to kind of get fuzzy. And there so there is a cattail. And it is 
it's going to break the box. So this frame is the box. And you see how that cattail is sticking out of it? That makes that whole thing feel like it is going to be in front of everything else here. And then people will see this in the foreground. And if I have something that looks vaguely like cattails out here, everybody's going to like, oh, those are cattails. And I know they are because I see this one that's right up here close to me. So I'm training the viewer to know what they're seeing when they're looking out here at something that's going to be a more sort of symbolic cattail. Um, I'm going to draw some of the, ed the top edges of these cattails here. So I'm not drawing lines all the way down like this. I'm going to draw it in some of the, 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 the front edge. And there are going to be some that are going to break down here. And, and I'm also along the bottom edge of it going to just sort of let people know that here's the bottom edge of this little kind of Thule marsh thing. Give it a place for a muskrat to hide right back in there. And I'm going to put a few little cattails on these. And then people see those little cattail things and they go like, oh, those are cattails. Or they're floating hot dogs. Um, so there's my, um, my, my cattails. I then have this area of damp mud right here. And there are going to be some puddles in it. So up in here, you know, here's a little kind of area of damp mud. And I'm making these sort of more kind of oval shapes. As I'm out here on the shore, this shore edge is going to kind of snake back in sharply out a little bit more. And then the front edge can be a little bit more rounded because it's closer to me. Remember that we had these, remember things that are closer to you, they get the edges of them more curved. Ones that are further away are more pointy, or narrow. Ones that are even further, more narrow. So look at this kind of deliberately saying out here, this point on the shore is further away from you because it's more pointy. This is also a more pointy one. Now this one coming towards us here, that's more rounded. Okay. What my this little area of marsh. Some damp soil there. Um, out here. I'm going to have another sort of zone of cattails that is coming out here. And I'm just going to lightly suggest that there's something out there, but I'm pressing less, I'm putting in less detail. There's the bottom edge of it. And there's some shoreline with that. So I've got. Take a look at, let's see, there's probably some distant sort of marshy things. I think we're seeing some of those in here. Yeah, look at these. 
foreground a little bit more detail, right? Middle ground back there, there's just sort of a line of, of marks. But as you get into the foreground here, you're gonna put in a few things that go like, oh, these are sort of cattail-y things. Here in this foreground, getting a little bit more detail. In the background, much more impressionable. And the very close foreground, you're saying like, oh, these are old marsh plants. Then people go like, oh, these are old marsh plants. In the back, I'm just gonna put in a little area of tone for another sort of patch of those things. Put a couple of ducks here in the water. I'm using a couple of uh, Tombow pens here. I have a workshop coming up of just sort of making simplified sketches and landscapes with Tombows. Um, I'm using two Tombow pens, the N95, which now has kind of a new meaning to us. So here's my N95 Tombow pen. It's a very pale gray one. And I also have an N75 which is a little bit darker. Um, and so I've got here sort of this suggestion of vegetation at different distances. There's some mud here. People see that there's some mud back there. And uh, there's a little landscape of some wetlands. Now let's think about, um, the other request was, could you think a little bit about um, composition? And so when I was doing this, I was not thinking about page composition. I was thinking about where can I get a chunk of available real estate to do this demo. But let's imagine for a moment that this was one of my nature journal pages. And I had put a bunch of stuff down on it. And I now want it to have kind of an overall composition. Um, here is here is the secret to um, page composition. Number one, overlap things. Number two, have a variety of sizes of major elements in it. So some things big, some things smaller. So if I overlap things and some are big and some are smaller, almost all the time, people look at it and go like, oh, how'd you get that cool composition? And all you did is you intentionally just overlapped some things. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, just kind of uh, help sort of highlight some of these things as, you know, this is, here's, here's one compositional unit. Then there's all this sort of stuff out here. Um, that is, let's see here. Um, this big alligator or crocodile, Nile crocodile, I'm going to turn this into a large horizontal block just by putting a frame around it. And
So now because this one here overlaps this, doesn't it look like this was this intentional thing? Right? That this was this planned thing that I had some original big plan of, I'm going to have these two elements here. These ones I'm not going to put in frames. And this one's going to break into that. And so I've got a number of smaller elements out here, a big element and a medium sized one. Huh. Let's just turn to another page that if you are here for this workshop, you know that this was not something where I was thinking about page layout. And what I did is I just put a bunch of things on the page as I was discussing some topic about, I think this was, this was bird legs. So let's, um, <clears throat> let's turn this into an intentional composition. What I'm going to do is I am going to, let's see. I am going to unify all these elements right here into one piece. So I'm, these are now a unit. I'm going to put a little bit of blue back behind these. And so that gives me, I didn't have one big chunk before. Now I have a big visual unit on this page. Um, and now I am going to, I'm gonna draw a little horizontal line here. And this is where I might put in my title. I can put so I could get, you know, spend more time messing around with it, but you know, whatever my title is, all right, I now have my title up there and I'm gonna then also blend that into my metadata box. So it's gonna slightly overlap that. So it's gonna have my, my, my location, my date, and my sense of my, what my weather is in there in this little metadata box. And so now people will look at this and there's this kind of sort of this visual unit here that all this is tied together. So there's big unit, there's some smaller things out here, there's this other chunk there. I can also think of if I'm writing all over this page, if I do some written descriptions of these birds, um, I want to think of those not just, I don't want to like write a little bit here, 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 write a little bit here. Little bit here. I can if I want to, but if I'm more thinking about page composition, I want to think of what if I actually had a block of text right here that's going to be that size and just to kind of um, I then am going to have uh, two blocks here that are going to be sort of similar in size and will visually kind of tie together. Um, no, I'm going to do three. So I could then, you know, write some little notes about these birds here. I'll write some other notes about these birds here. And here I'm going to put in a little map of the area. And 
And these might be some more little written notes and maybe a bullet list of some other observations that I made. So just thinking about these things as blocks and units, unifying some of them, getting some of them to overlap like this um, overlaps with this little bird. This little bird here is overlapping with this. If I get that overlapping going on the page and just units and blocks of different sizes, people then look at that and they go like, you planned that. All right, let's just go for another page of random stuff. All right, so I've got a page and on my page, um, I have some elephant seals. I had part of a drawing of a bird flying by sort of showing the sort of wingtip. I never finished it. <clears throat> um, I've got a poppy over here and this landscape. So right now it's sort of, it's a jumble of things that are on the page, but Notice if I kind of chunk some of these things that it's going to start to feel much more like there is like there is a planned layout behind it. This just I was you know uh, doing a little demo. I was talking to somebody and as we were um, as as we're doing this, um, I, I I put this page together. So I'm going to take this, I'm going to write in poppy. And I'm going to have this box slightly overlap that poppy just because I love me some overlap. Ooh, there's an opportunity to do some overlap. So look, that poppy's overlapping here with this box that says poppy. Whoa, what are the odds? And there it is. So here is this chunk that I've now created that is sort of poppy land. Um, up here, this was elephant seal um, stuff. Um, so I might in this area up here, I might write um, I'm going to write in this box San M -A -T -E -O, San Mateo coastline. But I'm going to take more time and make it into a cool title because I'm thinking about layout and things. Right. But that's that's where I'm that's but so there's now a long unit. I've got a box, I've got a long unit. Um, I am now going to let's put in a little bit more overlapping elements. I'm going to take all of these elephant seals here. And I'm going to put them into a box. I'm going to take this one here, and it's going to be a separate little kind of call out box. And ooh, look, some overlap. That box is kind of coming in there. So I might then write, um, you know, elephant seal. Um, down the side of that, and then that's kind of with that, but it's not in a box, so it's kind of different. This I'm going to let it be out there. But notice just sort of by having some of this sort of stuff, if there's any kind of space that kind of feels like an, an odd leftover for me. 
I can always put a meta box, metadata box down there, All right? Let me pull out some real nature journal journals where I was doing this. Hold on a second. Another thing that you can do is here, I've just got this blue pencil on hand. So I'm doing all this kind of demo with my blue pencil. But if you have your own set of colored pencils, you know what you can do? You can have lots of fun. All right, so look at that. <clears throat> this was a whole bunch of different stuff on the page. And I just put a box around here that wrote Malachite Kingfisher. And it feels like this is a unit. And then here's a little separate thing. So that was just writing in Malachite Kingfisher and putting a little box. Ooh, look, it's overlapping. Look, it's overlapping. Gosh, overlapping. And then people think like you've got, this is like some big plan. Um, here, um, imagine this page without this little framed element over here with this guy kind of overlapping into it. Um, this, you, you're visually kind of chunk this as a separate thing now because it's there. So there's this and then there's this other bit of information here. Um, let's go here. This was a jumble of birds on the page, but then I got out a blue pencil and I chose the blue pencil because this woodland kingfisher here had a bunch of blue in its feathers. So I picked it just a color that was on my page and I put a little box around this guy. I overlapped that with a box around this guy's, this one's name, then put a big frame around here that here's a little box around gray heron name. And then the box continues here, box continues here. So that was all just sort of after the effect, after the fact, kind of putting in some frames and things around different units in the picture. And that makes this a chunk and the page feels a little bit more intentional. Over here, I'm kind of doing a fun thing. It might be a little bit hard to see on the screen. Uh, yeah, you can't really see it. But if you're here live, um, actually what I've done is in this area right here, in here I actually have just a little bit of blue tone in that area or on the edges of those boxes and the same thing around here. So that I'm not putting the tone in the box, I'm putting the tone sort of around the edges of the box, which make this feel more like a chunk, this feel more like a chunk. There's a long horizontal frame. Here are things that are not in a frame. Frame, frame, and that frame is here with this name is overlapping this other frame. And these ones down here with these, these, <clears throat> these open build storks, I've got a frame around this. If I didn't have this, this would feel like much more of a jumble of things on the page. But because I have that, this feels like a unit and it's easier to scan the page. This is the same approach that I used when working on my field guide of the Sierra Nevada birds or the, the critters in the Sierra Nevada. You'll notice that there are some things that have yellow backgrounds on here. And what that does is it helps you see that this is a chunk, this is a chunk, this is a chunk. If I, these are all on a separate layer in the computer at the back, and I could turn off the layer and these yellow elements here disappear. But when I do that, the whole page ends up looking much more confusing and crowded. Because when I have this, your brain goes that it's easy to see those chunks going around the page. Let's just look at some different pages here. Right. So this, if, if it weren't for these, it would be more difficult 
to just sort of see like, oh, here are the different things around the page. So you see how those toned backgrounds and boxes and things help you be able to make sense of that page. This is all caddisfly larva across here. This little water snipe fly, it gets its own box. Why? Because otherwise, this, I want these words to kind of connect to this little critter. So you see that those tone areas help you visually chunk things on the page. And that's exactly what I'm doing here with that frame. Without that, the page feels like a clutter of all sorts of different things. Now here I've got some red brown critters. I've switched to a red brown pencil. Here's a page without that going on and notice that things are kind of just bumping into each other and it feels more cluttered. Even though there's not as much going on on this page, these are kind of competing with each other and, and it's harder to sort of navigate your way around the page. Here, whoops, right, I've got a big green frame around this. There's a chunk. Here's a chunk. Here's a chunk. These blue throated bee eaters, there is a box that goes around them. Over here, and they overlap out of it. Over here, this paradise flycatcher, its beak is breaking out of the box. I put a little box around this and let the tail hang out. And this page becomes easier to read. So those are some strategies that I use. Very often what I'm doing is I am just, I'm throwing a bunch of stuff on a page and then after the fact, putting in my composition. Sometimes, like, you know, here's a page without that. So this is looking at some mountain gorillas. And, you know, your eye doesn't really know where to go. There's no chunking. Had I chunked some things on this page, it would be visually easier to scan. I hope that this is a tool that, that you have fun with. There's no right way to do it. And by the way, it doesn't, a page doesn't have to have a composition. Um, don't think that like, like I, I want to record what's going on with these ducks. And now you're telling me I need to worry about a page layout. Um, you don't have to do anything that's more of kind of an aesthetic fun thing it makes your can make your page easier to scan and sometimes i enjoy doing that and and it's neat to sort of sit down and kind of like i'm going to chunk these things together but you don't have to and don't don't feel supposed to pressure with it some people um do a really um, cool thing where they'll at the start of a nature journal page, they will block everything in. I'm going to have my title here in this space. I'm going to have three sections here. And then I'm going to have this other little overlapping inset down here. And then as they're going along, I'm going to put this in there. I'm going to put this in there and this in there and this in there. For me, it usually doesn't work that way. I'm not thinking that far ahead. I'm going, squirrel, 
Right? Get some notes down by the squirrel. Squirrel, oh, like, look, I can see the head of the squirrel. I'm gonna get the head of the squirrel, okay? Like, oh, there's a fuzzy tail. Look at that fuzzy tail. I'm getting a fuzzy tail down. And then I just end up with all this stuff down on the page. And then I can use this, what we call post hoc composition, um, because you kind of create this composition after the hawk flies away. So you've been sketching your hawk, right? The hawk flies away. Now you get post hoc composition. And you can put in some of these boxes. You can use where you put your metadata box. You can use putting in titles or subtitles, names of things, bad puns. Um, if you do it with a color that matches a number of elements on your page, um, and then bring that color into the title, everybody thinks like you're like, you had to plan this out, didn't you? But really, you were kind of looking at it later on, kind of going like, oh, there's blue. I'm going to get some blue. And, and it works. So if this is fun for you, have some fun with it. If it feels like, like another thing and it's not your jam, don't worry about it. Again, nature journaling, we're not about pretty pictures. We're about being in the presence of nature and having our mind blown by how magnificent nature is. We also sometimes, it can be fun to mess around with your page. And this is a great way to mess around with your page. I hope that was useful, everybody. Let's take a look now at our nature journal community, um, uh, our, our nature journal community here. We're going to see if anybody wants to share things that you've been doing, ideas, thoughts, um, and, and, and feel free to kind of get in here with us and, um, and, and share that. Um, if you don't feel comfortable sharing, you don't have to, but I really want to um, encourage first timers here. If you've never shared before, I want, I, I want to encourage you, give it a try, and you'll find that it's, once you kind of uh, kind of come out into the daylight with this crew here, they're really fun. They're, people are lovely and they will support you and um, you might make some new friends. And uh, it'll also be cool to, to, to meet some of the, to some of the, the, the new faces around our, our, our group here. Oh, look at all these journal, journal pages. Um, Heather, can we start off with you? Thank you so much for joining us. In just a moment, I'm going to add you as a spotlight here, and I need to make it possible for you to unmute yourself. Uh, Heather, you now can unmute yourself. Hi, everybody. Oh. Uh, I typically tend to think uh, in layout form. Oh, that's that's great. Yeah, if if like some people who if if you think in layout form, that is great. And you'll find that that's going to make things a lot easier for you. Um, yeah, we have no idea what you're going to have us do. So I just start on the paper and then I just tie it together. Yeah. So, but notice how Heather is overlapping things. Look at this, some of this intentional overlap. And also because she's bringing in that, you notice in the top left-hand corner, that sketch is done with that color. And she's brought that same color in down below that makes that 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 makes that page feel much more like a planned composition. All my sketchbooks for the most part are with color erase pencils. They're soft, they're waxy, they're easy to erase, and they're beautiful. They make beautiful calligraphy lines. And then I use uh, for the highlights, I use these uh, brush pens. One is a zig brush pen white and the other one will just come up when you do a search on uh, jet pens. And it's in Japanese. Oh, so those are white brush pens. Yeah. And something to note about white brush pens, don't store them vertically. You'll, they'll dry up. They have to be laying flat. Oh, that's really helpful. Those are really helpful tips. I didn't, I've never used a white brush pen. Um, Heather, I'm going to have to give that a try. They're beautiful, That's beautiful. They lay in beautifully. That's great. Are they fairly opaque? This one is transparent. The Zig is very opaque. 
That's cool. That's going to give me more control than I've been using this um, Presto big jumbo correction pen, which gives you kind of a one size thick line. I bet that brush pen, the Zig, I could have. I want to check out a Zig. Yeah, it's calligraphy. I, I always, uh, I'm a, I'm a supply freak, so I buy everything you show. <laughs> so I have the Presto, and I like it if I just want a, um, a dense white line. But yeah. if I want something calligraphic, I want to use a brush. So she, by calligraphic, um, Heather's mentioning that like, if she presses harder, she gets a thicker line. At least she can get a thin or thick line. And that's really helpful. Thank you so much for sharing this. You're welcome, Jack. And just let you know, I've been watching since this started. And uh, you said first timers for sharing. So first time. Hey, Heather, we're really, really happy to have you with us. Thank you so much. That was really fun. Um, cool to, to, to meet some new friends in this community. Again, if you feel comfortable um, doing so, I uh, all you have to do is just sort of hold your journal up to your screen and we'll know. Um, let's meet um, Sherry. Um, Sherry, it is great to have you with us. Hi, everybody. This is literally my third drawing. <laughs> Oh. That's it. I live in, in Tucson and our backyard is like a, a, copper, a potpourri of uh, different cactus and succulents. And so I've been sitting on my porch because it's very hot here already. And every day I just position my chair and look at another one. And so I don't know much about all the blocking, but I did start to write some notes and about what I was observing and I'm just having a great time. I made a commitment, Jack, to watch one of your videos every day and then to draw every day for at least two weeks. So oh. I'll see how it all goes, but I'm pretty excited, so. So um, Sherry, we want to, at the end of this project, we also really want to, to check in with you and see what that experience was like. Thank you for taking that dive and, and jumping in with it. It's gonna make a huge difference. Thank you. Um, is this an Ocotillo? No, it's a different kind of, um, I looked it up yesterday. It's a bare grass type of um, uh, cactus. Yeah, maybe it is a bare, Sarcha Eurista something. <laughs> I have to find the common name for it, but it's got little frilly things all over it. And um, so, so yeah. you have, do you have a lot of cacti and succulents um, uh, accessible to you? Oh yeah, they're in my backyard. <laughs> so, um, Sherry, a lot of people have made some requests for some classes on succulents and things. So okay. um, if I get my act together, I will do uh, one for you, which will be kind of help you have some fun with all those backyard friends. Oh, that's great. I've done a couple others. Let me see. You know, I don't have time for everything, but um, I don't know if I can find it now. I had these really large sketchbooks, so I've been using those up first. Oh, well, I can post it next time. But um, hey. and I'm really forcing myself to look at another one every day. And even though I've lived in this house for three years, um, springtime, everything just explodes. So it's been really amazing to notice them uh, in this way. So. Thank you. And, and what folks, what you see that what Sherry is doing is she is forcing herself outside of her comfort zone to, to she's given herself a project and she's challenging herself to do something that is going to be work for her brain because she's going to do that and do it on a regular basis. Those are the ingredients you need for neuroplasticity to get your brain to start to like develop these new things pushing your brain just outside of its comfort zone and then getting yourself to be consistent with that, that is, that makes a huge, huge difference. So this is going to be, you say two weeks? Two weeks. Two weeks. I'm Go for it. Four. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. Really, it's amazing what you do. Well, I'm so happy and honored to be here with this community. Um, it's what got me through COVID as well. Thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, yes, you're saying. No, I just said thank you, everybody. Great, and, and thank you, Sherry.
Uh, I really like your idea of, uh, of that uh, two week challenge. You know, pick up, but, but she's bitten off something that, 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 is, that, that she can choose, she can do it, and it's going to push her. Um, let's, um, if there's a, another person in our community who is, is new, um, or um, let's see, we've got uh, anybody else. I, I want anytime you feel comfortable sharing, please do. I'm going to go. I see uh, Linda has got um, something to share. Um, Linda, it's really good to see you. Hi, my God. Hey there. How have you been? It's it's I've been so it, I've been a little bit too busy actually, <laughs> but but good but good. My my day job sometimes interferes with my day, day nature journaling to tell you the truth. But today I said I don't care. I'm too busy, but I'm coming anyway. So uh, that you know when you talk about the growth mindset, the uh, uh, what's a lady that was just talking. Uh, uh, Oh, Kekis, anyway, sure. when, when she was, when, when Sherry, uh, about growth mindset, doing something out of her comfort zone, it's out of my comfort zone to interject things when I'm too busy, but because I talk myself out of it. So today I had the best time. I mean, it's, it's not a pretty picture, but it's like a combination of sketch noting and what have you. Uh, uh, let's see. Can, Oh yeah, I mean, what a, I mean, it's just so dynamic and active. Um, reminds me of um, pages which we've seen uh, Ray Bonto uh, put together with all of this, you know, color and energy and notes <laughs> and bringing them all together. Um, that's really exciting to see. Thank you. My brain on paper. Yikes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And when we get it out of our head and onto the paper in front of us, our brains, oh, look at the, the reflections of the, um, those treetops in that puddle there. Isn't that cool? Uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I feel, felt like um, it, when I got it all on paper, I was just so happy. And it, it looks all crazy, but I'm just so happy. So thank you for that. <laughs> Oh, uh, Linda, thank you so much for sharing. Okay, well, I, unless you have anything else to say, I'm, I'm good to turn it over to the next person. Take it away, next yeah, person. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> and you've, got, you've got on that page all the, 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 the key points for the day. Yeah, thank uh, you. Thank you. Well, and, and, and some of that was brand new news to me and others old news, but it's all, you know, there's repeating. So it was just really good, really good. And so, um, yeah, keep on sharing the joy, Jack. <laughs> we will, we will indeed. So okay. uh, we're going to uh, follow that up with, um, I'm going to jump over to Ray Bonto and then to Valters. We're going to check in with them and see what is going on. Uh, Ray Bonto, it's good to see you again. How have you been? Great. Absolutely great. Uh, um, um, I started with this. Sometimes I copy drawings. Uh, yes, I use yes. my favorite pencils 9B and 12B. So. Yeah. And I, I love your the, the contrast. Oh, you even uh, when you're looking at that little um, that M C Escher sketch, you even uh, did a little study of the M C Escher sketch. Yeah, that's cool. Yes, uh, this might be like look like watercolor, but it's actually twelve B. It's that dark. Mm-hmm. Pencil. Um. Yeah. So now. Yeah. So and and I like the way you have um, on that uh, the, on that landscape sketch on the side. There was really good use of overlap with those things that were breaking the box. Let's see what's up in your nature journal. So um, I was just getting pigeons here. Well, yeah. I did this flower. Uh, Look at that stigma in the the middle of it. Uh, the the, uh, the the pistol in the middle of that uh, flower there, that green structure sticking up. Um, 
such a cool structure. I like the way you're also making a jump by putting the high contrast dark behind it. And I was doing this. I have to sketch this flower. And I couldn't paint it. Um, I didn't have time. But. The yeah. Nice use of negative shape. <laughs> So notice that Ray Bonto is really uh, punching in those negative shapes around the flower. Um, as artists, we want to train ourselves to sometimes look at the petal, and then sometimes we're looking at the shape of the air next to the petal. And that's what uh, is, is really punching in there. That was great. Could we hold that one up again, which the, that flower with the, um, with the negative shapes. So yeah, punch in those negative shapes really look at the shape of that that negative shape and very often when you do that you'll go like oh that doesn't work that's it's not quite fitting and that is a great clue that there's something that you need to tweak or change on your on your sketch thank you uh, thank you and on sunday i got to go to richmond park which is the biggest city park in Europe. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the jackal. Um, so okay. I got that. Oh, wait, wait, well, sorry, what, what species did you find there? Jackal. A oh. dino crow. Nice. And. The, the, wait, 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 hold, hold that jackal up for us. Then we went to a lake. Wait, wait, just tilt it towards us again. Oh, this is cool. Yeah, really, I can sort of see. I like the, the, the I, I love what you do with that soft pencil. And then. Um, this is a water soluble, but not soluble, but still. Um, now, this was the best part a swift. I got oh. to see a swift. Wow. Oh, that's really yeah, fun. Yeah, they were just going crazy around. Um, <clears throat> And I went to a lake. This way most common. There was a Canada goose. And one came uh, was coming very, very close to me uh, until it was only an inch from my book. And then it reached up and bit it. Uh, but I they quickly snatched away with getting paper. The goose wanted the nature journal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so. uh, did, did it leave a mark on the paper? No. No. Oh, it was it really if, the, if the goose left a mark, um, then you could draw a little line pointing to it and say "goose bite." <laughs> <laughs> That's um, really cool. Um, and they were quite friendly. The geese up there and. And okay, here this was an even better part than the Swift. There was a mute swan. I saw the cheeks too, so I got that. Uh, later, I saw an Egyptian goose, and I also saw some mallards. The best yeah. part ever. I saw a mandarin duck. Oh, oh my gosh! Look at this thing. These patterns are crazy. And what is the, with that weird little kind of scoop <laughs> yes. feather thing in the back? They're such crazy looking ducks. That you had so much fun here. Yeah. I did. Yeah. And also I saw Canada Goose here. And it was just sitting there. Um, I came back and did all this detail. Um, mm -hmm. And I saw its cheeks too. They were like lime green. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, four, I think. Yeah, three or four. Um, and I saw a gray light goose. Wow, um, you're really getting the, 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 the waterfowl are really cooperating for you. Yes. Um, I mean, not exactly, but um, 
that's because uh, well i learned to do a bit more <laughs> getting the whole body in the field mm, and then uh, i saw a word that i've never seen before at least i don't remember seeing a really? pop oh oh cool yes yeah um i just saw a brown thing going and i and it went underneath and i thought i just take a peek so i did and there's a pop art um drinking water oh nice <laughs> nice job capturing that i like those angles in the neck that you're showing um at on the the uh in that sort of drinking pose also take a look at the gray leg goose um below as it's putting its neck forward again you're really carefully observing the contours of the neck in those positions i mean that's a really unexpected position if we were to make up the position of a goose neck when it puts its head forward there's no way we would make something like this up but that's actually what we see so really good observation you have to really go with what you see rather than what you think it should be like when you're drawing something like yeah, it's not like it's just pointing down. It's like the, that. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, this was uh, this was a mute swan look uh, through my binoculars. That was just a incomplete landscape as well. This was a swift that dared to come within a meter of us. I mean, like half a meter. Uh, <laughs> and and, and one of its wings was bent in and the other was out and it just oh. and flew over. They're, they're, those wings are just so fast. Yeah. So, I mean, they glide, but they are so fast. You can hardly, you, there's no use using binoculars or swapping skills. On. That's right. That's a be impossible. Don't even try. Right. Wow. Uh, so, um, then this was the best part ever. Okay, we went on the bus and went to another, the other side of uh, Richmond by accident. Uh, and there was some fallow deer over there. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Look at this. Look at these patterns. Oh, starting to come out into um, and is are the antlers starting to grow on that? Mm, look like it was quite short. Um, yeah, there's a younger one. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh wow! Again, uh, nice, quite pinkish. Yeah. Yep. And um, was it covered with a little fuzzy layer? Uh, yeah. It was a bit furry. Yeah. So the um, when the antlers start to grow, they um, when the antlers start to grow, they are um, they're covered with this uh, a, a fuzzy skin, which we, they call velvet, and then and it's super vascularized. So there's lots of blood that then goes up into the antlers, so that they can grow really really fast. The next time you go back out here, if you go back soon, you're thinking, well, they couldn't have grown that much in this time. Let's see if you can find these again, and you'll be blown away at how much those antlers have grown. Oh. This um, is so cool. Oh. This, so I think, was a female because it didn't have any antlers. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, this. Um, they were just sitting, so it was quite easy to draw. I came back and did all the spots and detail. Um, and then uh, one uh, person's do pet dog scared them and they, and they got up. Oh. Uh, and then uh, one got up and went over to. Well, let me just, everybody check this out. Look at just. Um, as it as it moves, Ray Bonto moves, right? So um, it's got you, the head turned away from you. Uh, Ray Bonto is going to flow with that position. Head inside profile, flow with that. 
um, front view um, stands up, now focusing on what are the shapes of those, those legs and the proportions of those. So really just not getting tunnel vision into one drawing, but flowing with all those different poses as they go. That's really cool to see. That's really exciting. Thank you, Graham. So this was some more here. Yeah, this was a uh, little crowd. I don't know, black and brown okay. one. A question for you, um, Ray Bonto. Are you using negative shapes a lot as you're looking at these? Are you like looking at the contour of the back, kind of looking past the deer to kind of get that um, that that shape, or are you focusing on the the, the shape and the contour, of, or, or just or focusing on the animal itself? Do you find yourself in the field using that negative shape technique? Um, not much. Not much. Um, oh, could we get closer but... to those quick sketches of the deer in the bottom there? Um, look at the line variation here. Right, so instead of one hard line kind of going all the way across, you can see those lines someplace darker, some places lighter. That line variation really active makes for a drawing that's much more interesting. That's cool to see. Ah. Thanks. Uh, we have to see the dead bug. Um, so I got that. Yeah. And then the next day, we. Uh, I went out to the park and um, I saw a pied wagtail. So I got in all the details I could see. And with an extremely fine brush, the one that comes with the mini cotton kit. Um, and oh, that's fine. So I it just. The tone paper is the water. perfect tool for. Um, Yes, that, that torn paper for a pied wagtail is the ideal medium because you get to push in the whites, the grays, the blacks. Oh, that looks like it was fun. I don't know if you can see it. Ah, is that, yep, and there's a look at you. Check you out. <laughs> Oh, this makes me really happy to see you out there in that field, so engrossed, so calm and focused. Ah, that's that's wonderful to see. I know. I'll share the rest next week. Um, uh, well, great <laughs> for sharing this with us today. It is just a delight to go on this virtual adventure with you, see the pages of those journals, and um, just want to encourage people to, um, to this. What you're looking at here is if you are going to use paper, I think that this is the best possible use of paper that we could possibly have. There's, um, if you're thinking like, oh, I should really conserve paper and because they come from trees, well, reduce the amount of junk mail that comes into your house. Do that. And then you've got license to go do as much artwork as you want. Um, the more of these pages we fill with attention and, and, and love, the more the beauty of the world is going to come up and, and, and be accessible to you. Hey, thank you so much. Okay, Walters. Um, good evening to you. Thank you, Dad. Hey, thank you, folks, so much. Hello. Hello Hi. there. Uh, um, are you out in the field right now? Yeah, uh, yeah, we are here uh, at uh, uh, in a place called Kolka, and we are uh, just like a little birding trip birding nature watching a lot of uh, birds of prey are going over here and uh so yeah looking at those pretty much all day so yeah that sounds like a good day so you've had a day full of birding we cannot wait yeah to well see... not not this day i arrived i arrived in like midday so 
I just went out and watched some warblers and saw like a Merlin and uh, uh, like Merlin and black kite and red kite, but uh, uh, tomorrow probably in the morning. So I'm going to wake up early and then go there. So yeah, but there's another thing. I got the John Busby uh, drawing birds book and just like that. <laughs> So I just started drawing more loosely, kind of getting more poses tried and switched back to pencil. Somehow I felt like the pen, uh, because it was so fine, it was made, making me want to do more details. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, this is a pie flycatcher. Yeah, I think that's the English name. This, uh, I really like this, how I got, I like it. Before it lands, usually it kind of hovers in one spot in the air. So, uh, yeah. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. I think that the for fast sketching a broad tipped soft pencil like you see John Busby using is such an amazing tool. Mm -hmm. um, it is. Yeah. No. So here's some yellow wagtails and well I don't remember the English names of these but yeah been doing these fast sketches a lot oh I hold those a little bit closer to the camera yes 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 oh this is yeah. really exciting just all of these poses and angles and moments. Mm -hmm. And today also, I w since I arrived in midday and uh, there weren't a lot of uh, birds of prey going, just sketched some, uh, uh, just sketched some turns and also did some reflections. Mm -hmm. Also inspired by John Bisbee a, li a bit, yeah. Yeah, John Busby's stuff is really, really powerful. Just the the the, the master of bird gesture gesture. Um, there, there's an aliveness and an immediacy to those drawings. Mm -hmm. um, uh, right now, I am in conversation with a bird artist that I'm going to bring on that I would like you to meet. That I think you will also really connect with. Um, her name is Debbie Kaspari. And um, she does stuff with pencil and um, just some soft pencil sketches, really immediately capturing gesture of birds. I think that you'll, um, you'll really enjoy her um, getting to, to, to meet her. And there's yeah. I think, really powerful ties to what we're seeing with um, with with John Busby? Yeah, there's one kestrel from today. There was. Uh, bring it a little bit closer in. Uh, yeah, well, it's it's butt it is her. really fat. <laughs> Looks very very fat, but uh, yeah, yeah, just when it gets uh, cold, they just puff out like. Oh uh, no! It's plus twenty eight. Well, well, you said Celsius. So today it was like ten plus 10, like two days ago, and 30 today. Oh, yeah, so wow. well, that's... pretty hot. It's pretty hot here, yeah. But mm, oh, it was, uh, I didn't, I don't that, like Did you get a it. sketch of that Merlin? Merlin? The Merlin No, no, Merlin, I just saw him fly by. Oh, just, oh, yeah, yeah this was like, woo, he's gone. Yeah, but John, oh, um, I, I didn't like the John Busby sketches. They were a bit like too messy for me. He's like going all smudgy a little bit and ooh, went dark. <laughs> uh, he's going all smudgy. And, oh, oh uh, I, actually, I think the thing that was uh, bringing the light in was... Was my I, screen, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. There we go. Yeah. Oh, now, now you've got your light on. Okay, that's good. So now I can turn this off. Yeah. Um, we'll move spotlight. Um, is there any other um, sketches of, of local birds that you might want to share with us? Well, a lot of turns, strong light, a lot of 
turns have been not much has been happening probably a big day tomorrow but some more turn sketches so you realize that this so, is yeah um, um, everybody notice the, the direction that those uh turns are pointing this is a right turn yeah <laughs> um <laughs> This is, so again, a uh, great gesture capturing the, the oomph of this body and the proportions of this body, just immediate and fast. That one that is looking towards you down there, um, that's really, really fun. Um, yeah, that just, yeah. That, they just look so quaffed. Um, also, um, when, whenever you want, um, throwing gouache on top of a turn drawing on tone paper. Ah, mm. uh, life is good. Life is good when there's gouache on a turn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, probably big day tomorrow. So a lot of it's nighttime here already, almost midnight, and a lot of uh, bats going around and owls. So yeah. It's uh, beautiful here where I'm at in, in the north, northern part of uh, Latvia. So, yeah. Well, the, Big day. I cannot wait to see what you get on your, in your journal pages tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be an incredible day. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Thank hey, you, Jack. Thank you so much. Really uh, appreciate you giving us um, that insight and view into um, what you have been up to. I'm going to jump over to um, Sharon Roy. Hi. Uh, yeah, this is, I tried a new to me technique of stippling. And so it was, it really challenged my brain to think about making the shapes with the outlines. And, um, and to, on this one, I tried to indicate that there was a fold in the leaf. I don't know that it was completely successful, but it was very meditative. And I had a fountain pen that was filled with green ink. And so I just said, you know, I've been meaning to try this. I'm going to give it a go. So there you are. And, and, and when you get in the right frame of mind, just sort of sitting there, um putting your your, your dot, dots and marks in the, the leaf starts to sort of appear in front of you yes um, it, that's the, really fun. the first few minutes i'm just going oh i don't know this is not going to work but yeah i just said persist <laughs> and i did and um the the leaves started to take form so oh it, that's really fun and it also just gives them a softness so yeah, it's just, I just wanted to try something new. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, the with the um, with with stipple drawings, you know, it it your brain will start to kind of get into a completely different pattern. You're sort of making this sort of repeated movements, and it can be. Um, it'll either drive you nuts and you'll hate it, or you'll get into a meditative state and you'll love it. Um, so that's really fun. Are there any other journal pages or moments that people wanted to share? Thoughts or ideas? Margarita, it is so good to see you. I hope you are and your community is safe. How are things and how are you in Mexico? Let me unmute. Uh, we're doing better. We're supposed to be getting vaccines at the end of the month. I've heard they've arrived in La Paz, so everybody's very optimistic. So uh, life is definitely looking better. And uh, weather is perfect. This is the ideal time of year to be here. The desert gardens are just uh, flourishing. So yeah, we're, we're all very optimistic now. Thanks for asking. Oh, that's great to hear. That's great to hear. Yeah. I know that you and your community has really been through the ringer. Yeah, it's been rough. It's been, we're kind of down at the bottom of the list, uh, just slightly above India and Brazil. So, uh, but it's looking optimistic, so we're happy. Uh, but 
I just wanted to circle back. I mean, oh gosh, you know, everybody's done such wonderful things and these young people are so inspiring. Um, but uh, well, I wanted to circle back to our lesson today, Jack, and thank you so much on the ideas of strategy. I went back to one of my previous pages from one of our lessons and tried to put the boxes and stuff around. And oh my goodness, it is so much clearer, the information that I can now flip to this page. I'll show you um, just all, I mean, all the stuff here, but I didn't have it boxed or organized. And just putting those few highlights on there, I can flip to this page and immediately see about the head, the top of the head, the slights of beaks. And it was all there before, but not the strategy you just showed us today. So I just want to thank you so much for that gift of that tip. But yeah, the post hoc composition is, I'm, I'm always surprised, like, oh, and there was a little composition that was waiting to happen. And it also makes it this little kind of fun little challenge, like, how am I going to organize this page? Oh, yes, really and it fun. didn't have to be strategy I thought about prior to taking notes during class. It, it all yeah. came afterwards, which is a surprising tip and um, knowledge for me. So thank you so much. That's great. Thank you. We'll see you thank next you so lesson. Much. Um, and uh, that, that uh, little golden crown sparrow, right? Um, such an interesting little bird. They're now on their way up north to, um, to Alaska now. And, oh, wow. uh, so um, down here in the Bay Area, all our, our golden crowns have have flown the coop and they're they're on their way up, up north. Uh, it's just this wonderful little seasonal bird that we get. Yeah, we've got a lot of uh, quail and roadrunners and uh, woodpeckers uh, here now that it's fun to see them. They're just and tons of little hummingbirds. Uh, the Zantus hummingbird is here. And it's only native to Baja Sur. Um, and I, I put in all these new hummingbird attractant plants that are yes. just flourishing. So it's so fun to watch them and hear them around between four to seven at night. I can hear all the of their little wings flapping. And uh, yeah, everything is alive right now. It's it's great. Uh, oh, that's... So. Um, I'm really happy to hear that. And I'm really glad to see your flourishing. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to you guys. This whole community has been wonderful. Yeah, it, it takes a village and we're here for each other. Thanks. Thank you. Um, well, my friends, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, we really appreciate your uh, your willingness to 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 share with each other, inspire each other, help us um, also just reach out and have some contact with with other human beings celebrating what is is good in this world. And um, we need to find those things, um, hold to them, celebrate them, and protect them together. And let's protect each other. As we're coming out of this pandemic, we can still do a lot to help keep other people in our community safe. Let's look out for each other, look out for our elders, and um, see what we can do as, as a community to, to, to pull through this with more of a sense of stronger relationships in spite of this isolation. Thank you all for being here.